Hello and welcome to Mr. Tompkins EdTech and a brand new series of videos aimed at helping you prepare for your GCSE mathematics exams. In this series I'll be giving a complete walkthrough of the GCSE mathematics practice papers to help you prepare for your exams this summer. Now there are not so many of these and you don't want to squander them so make sure you try the paper yourself first before you look at these solutions. This particular paper is AQA June 2022, Paper 2, Foundation Tier. Check the front cover of your paper to make sure it's the same one. If it's not, have a look through the playlist linked above which includes all the GCSE mass video walkthroughs I've recorded so far. I'm busy recording all of the GCSE practice papers, so if the one you're looking for isn't there already, why not subscribe by clicking the big red button below and check back in a few days. Don't forget to click on the bell so that you'll get a notification when I upload the next paper. I'll put timestamps in the description below so you can choose to watch the whole thing through or you can click on the timestamp and jump to the particular question you need help with. If you have a question, check the comments below as someone else might have already asked the same thing. If it's a new question, Leave it in the comments and I will try and answer all of them as soon as I can. Don't forget to mention which question on the paper you're referring to and try and be as specific as possible. Finally, if this video helps you with your revision, please give it a thumbs up. It will really help me out and why not share the link with your friends because they might need a helping hand too. Okay, let's get into it. Question one, here is a number line. Which number is it A? Now we can see that the span of this uh, particular scale, it spans one unit, isn't it? It's going from one up to two, which is a span of one unit. And that one unit we've divided into one, two, three, four steps. So it's going to be one over four, isn't it? Each one of those steps is going to be one over four or a quarter. So that's going to be one and one quarter. That's going to be one and one half. That one's going to be one and three quarters, and that's going to be two. So A is at one and a half, and one and a half is the same thing as uh, 1.5 then, isn't it? It's that one there. Question two, here's an expression. I've got 5A plus 7B plus 9C. Which is the second term? Circle your answer. Okay. Well, the term are the different parts that are added together. So this is the first term, this is the second term, and this is the third term. So the second term there is, this one is then, isn't it? It's 7b, okay? Question three, how many hours are there in five days? Circle your answer. Okay, well, we've got days to hours. We've got one day is the same thing as 24 hours, isn't it? So five days, scaling that up by a factor of five, uh, five lots of 24, what's that then? Five 24s, that's, that's 120. 120, it's gonna to have to be that one there. Question four, which of these parts of a circle is a curve? Circle your answer. Um, well, if I draw a, quickly draw a circle, then we can label all these things. So the circumference is the distance around the edge. So the circumference is this bit around the edge. That's the circumference. The diameter, uh, that is a straight line that passes from one side of the circle to the other. So that's my diameter there. Uh, the center, well, that's the bit in the middle. That's that bit. And a radius is a line from the center of the circle to the edge. So my radius is that one there, okay? So uh, radius is straight, center is just a point, so it isn't straight or curved, and diameter is straight. So the only one that's curved is the circumference. It's that one there. Question 5a, write one and four ninths as an improper fraction. So an improper fraction is a top-heavy fraction, isn't it? So the number on the top is bigger than the number on the bottom. And if you've got a mixed number you want to convert into top-heavy fraction, the first thing to do is to take the whole number part and multiply it by the denominator part. So 1 times 9 is 9. And then we add on the numerator part. So 9 plus 4 is 13. So 1 and 4 ninths is the same thing as 13 ninths. Okay? 13 ninths. Convert 7 over 16 to a decimal. Now, luckily this is the calculator paper, so I can just actually type that into my calculator and work out what the answer is. 
So it's 7 divided by 16, not going to be a hero, I'm just going to type it in and work it out. My calculator is saying that's 0 0.4375. 0 0.4375. 5C 5 says round 2.84 to one decimal place. Well, the first decimal place is the first digit appearing after the decimal point, which is that 8. So if I'm going to round off after the, dec uh, the first decimal place, I'm going to round off after the 8. Then when you round off, the only thing you really need to think about is the very next digit after your rounding point, which in this case is 4. Uh, 5 or more raise the score, 4 or less let it rest, so this one is 4 or less. So we're going to round this one down. So 2.8, when you round down, it just stays the same as it was, so it's just going to stay being 2.8. Okay. If it was 5 or more, like a 2.85, we'd round up and get 2.9, but it isn't, so we don't, so it's 2.8. Question six, a machine to clean carpets can be hired. Uh, machine hired, 25 pounds per day. Cleaning fluids, one liter bottle is 10 pounds, a two liter bottle is 18 pounds. Rana wants to hire a machine for one day and buy five liters of cleaning fluid. Work out the smallest total amount she could pay. Okay, right, so I think what we're gonna do is gonna work out the cost of the cleaning fluid and then we're gonna add on 25, which is the machine hire. Okay, so cleaning fluid is one litre bottle for 10 and two litre bottles for 18. So if you're buying a two litre bottle, it works out cheaper per litre, doesn't it? That's, that's equivalent to nine, uh, nine pounds per litre. Uh, so it's cheaper to buy the two litre bottle, but obviously we don't want to buy more than we need. Uh, so I think we're going to need to buy two of those. That's going to give me four litres and then one of those. That's going to give me five litres altogether at the cheapest possible price. Okay. So one times 10 is 10, uh, two times 18, that's 36, and I've got one higher uh, day at, one, at 25 pounds, so that's a total of 25 pounds. So then the total cost is those things added together. So the zero, six, and the five adds up to 11, carry one. One, two, five, seven, that's, that's 71 pounds then. So the smallest possible amount you could pay is 71 pounds. Question seven, quadrilateral ABCD has an angle ABC equal to 90, BC is four centimeters, CD is parallel to BA, CD is six centimeters. Draw ABCD on the centimeter grid. AB has been drawn for you, okay? Now with these sort of things, it's very tempting just to dive straight in and start drawing on the grid, but you know, if you make a mistake, then it always looks really terrible. And uh, I think it's better just to plan it out first, just to kind of do a rough sketch, okay? So they've already given us the line AB, and I'm just gonna kind of sketch it out here first, AB. Uh, now they're saying angle ABC is 90. So when you write an angle in this form with three letters, the angle is actually in the middle letter there so that's where the angle is and the arms are going to stretch out to a and b a and c sorry so it's going to be an angle like this so a to b and then b up to c at 90 degrees okay so we're going to have a, like a 90 degree angle there so that's going to be so we're going to have a straight line going up to c okay and we're told that bc which is this length here look this length here, B to C, that's four centimeters, okay? Uh, and then we're told that C to D is parallel to B to A. Well, here's B to A in this, uh, here, so a line parallel to that is going to be a line like this, okay? So that's going to be parallel, so D is gonna be somewhere along there. And C to D is six centimeters. Now, A to B, if you count on the grid, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's gonna be shorter than um, the other line, isn't it? So I'm just gonna redraw that on my sketch. Because I did that one a bit long. So it's gonna be shorter than AB, okay? Uh, so it's gonna be a parallel line, but it's gonna be shorter than AB. So then I'm gonna have like a line coming down to A like that. There's my D up there, okay? Now, once I'm happy with the sketch, that's six. That's already drawn, it's A, and then I'm just gonna finish it off like that. I've got a good idea of what this looks like now. I can go ahead and just draw it on the grid and um, draw once. So, you know, plan twice, draw once is, is a good uh, good motto here. So I'm gonna draw a line from B upwards, which is four units, just following my plan now. Uh, line going straight up there. And then 
At that point, we're going to turn, we're going to go six units in this direction. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then at that point there, we're going to turn and we're going to go head back down to A, aren't we? Okay, just labeling the corners, that's C there, that's D. Okay, so that was four, that was six, and we're back to where we're going. That was a right angle, and they were parallel, so that must be a right angle as well. Okay, so there we go. There's my shape. Question eight. The masses of some puppies were recorded. The smallest mass was seven kilograms, 200 grams. The range of masses was 650 grams. What was the largest mass? Give your answer in kilograms and grams. Okay, so this is the smallest one, and we're told that the range is uh, 650. Now, the range is the distance between the highest and the lowest. So given that the range is equal to highest minus lowest, and I know that the range is 650 grams, and I know the lowest was 7 kilograms, 200 grams. That's 7,200 grams, isn't it? Okay, so what take away 7,200 is 650? Well, it's going to be those two numbers added together then. So the highest is going to be uh, the lowest plus the range, isn't it? Okay, so it's going to be that 7,200 plus the 650. That's giving me 7,850 grams, which in kilograms and grams is 7 kilograms, 850 grams then, isn't it? So 7 kilograms, 850 grams. Question nine, Ali revises each day for five days. On each day of the first four days, he revises from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. On the fifth day, he starts revising at 1 p.m. He finishes when he is revised for a total of 18 hours for the five days. What time does he finish on the fifth day? Okay, so we've got the total, it adds up to 18. We know for four days, he is revising from 5 to 8. Now that is a three hour period, isn't it? So from 5 p.m. to 8, hour, uh, 8 p.m., that's three hours, okay? So on the first four days, he is doing four lots of three hours that adds up to 12 okay so then on the fifth day it's going to be the difference between that 12 we've worked out there and the 18 hours he's done in total so uh hours hours on fifth day that's going to be the total hours 18 subtract the 12 hours he was doing on the four other days. So that leaves a total of six hours remaining, okay? So if he started revising at 1 p.m. and we add six hours, we're gonna, that's gonna take me up to 7 p.m. then, isn't it? Uh, so that's my answer, 7 p.m. Um, yeah, we can just write it like that. That's how they wrote it in the question, so 7 p.m. So, 9b is totally unrelated to 9a, weirdly. So, Sophia is revising for maths. She tries to work out 3 times 4 plus 2, and here's her working. She's saying that 3 times 4 plus 2, that's the same thing as 12 plus 3, which is equal to 15. What mistake has she made? Well, what she's done is she's multiplied that 3 and the 4 together, which is fine. You can do it that way. Uh, but if you do, you need to also multiply the 3 and the 2 together. So, that one there, that should be 6, shouldn't it? Okay, so it should be 12 plus 6, uh, giving me a total of 18. So what mistake she made, um, she has not multiplied um, 3 times 2. Correct answer should be 12 plus 6, which is equal to 18. Okay? Question 10. Lines A, B, and B, C are shown. Part A says, write down the coordinates of C. Okay, so C is here, look. It's that point there. Uh, now, when you're working out coordinates, you go kind of along the corridor and up the stairs, don't you? So the first digit is how far along from the x-axis we're going, which is 8 units. So it's eight units in this direction, so the x-coordinate is eight, and then we're going one unit up, 
so the y coordinate is 1, so it's 8, 1. And then part B says write down the coordinates of the midpoint of AB. Now the midpoint of AB is halfway between the two of them. So if you have a look at how long this line is, it's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 digits long. So half of that is 3, so 1, 2, 3. So the midpoint of this line is going to be here, isn't it? That's the midpoint. So what's the coordinates of that point? Again, if we count along the corridor, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that coordinate there is at 7, 6, 7, 6. Part C says D is a point on the grid that makes A, B, C, D a parallelogram. Work out the coordinates of D. Okay. Well, a parallelogram is going to have uh, two pairs of parallel sides. So the line CD, the missing line, uh, one of the missing lines is going to be parallel to AB. So if you look at the AB, that's like six units horizontally. So my CD line is also going to be six units horizontally. It's going to be six units from C going leftwards there. So one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. Okay, and then joining that up with A then. It's going to make my parallelogram. Okay. Uh, so work out the coordinates of D. So D is going to be this corner of the parallelogram down here then. And the coordinates of that then are at 2, 1 then, aren't they? So that one is 2, 1. Uh, write down the equation of the line passing through A and B. Now horizontal lines uh, always start with Y is equal to. Vertical lines start with X is equal to. But this is horizontal, so it's Y is equal to. And it's going to be equal to whatever number here it passes through. You can see it passes through the y-axis at 6. So the equation of this straight line is just y is equal to 6. Question 11. Nihal has savings of £168. He uses 5 sevenths of his savings to buy sports equipment. Part A says, assume that he will use one third of the rest of his money to buy a shirt. How much of his savings in pounds will he have left? Okay. So we need to work out what 5 sevenths of £168 is first, because that's how much he spent on the sports equipment. So we're going to have to find 5 sevenths of 168 Once we've got that, then we're going to have to find a third of the rest, which is the remainder after he's spent on um, sports equipment. Okay, so let's find the 5 sevenths first. Well, actually, what I think I might do is I might just find 2 sevenths, because if you think about it, if he's got... Uh, his whole money and he spends five sevenths then he's got two sevenths left over then isn't he so it's going to just be easier for me to find two sevenths and then say that's the remainder so uh, remainder is going to be two sevenths of 168 now this is just a calculator paper and I'm lazy so I'm just going to type that into the calculator two sevenths times 168 uh, that comes to 48. Okay, so 48 pounds is remaining. Now we want to find a third of that. So the money he spent, oh no, we want how much money is of his savings will he have left after he buys a shirt. So uh, his final remainder uh, after he's bought the shirt then. So if you think about, we're going to do the same sort of uh, thinking here. So if we take uh, one third of 48 to be the amount that he spent on a shirt, that means he's got two thirds of 48 left over again, isn't it? So I'm just going to find two thirds of 48 uh, as a bit of a shortcut. So again, just tapping that into the calculator. I could do it in my head, but the calculator's here. So I made that 32. Okay, so he's got 32 pounds remaining. Now, like I say, you could just work out five sevenths and take it away from 168 and then find a third of that and take it away from 100, uh, 48. But you're just doing two extra steps uh, where just doing that simple kind of fraction subtraction in your head uh, makes it makes the rest of it a bit easier okay now part B says in fact he uses more than a third of the rest of his shirt part B says in fact he uses more than a third of the rest of the money to buy a shirt what does this tell you about how much of his savings he has left uh, tick one box it is more than the answer to part A it is the same as the answer to part A. It's less than the answer to part A. It's not possible to tell. Okay. So 
This is quite straightforward, isn't it? If he spends more than a third of his remaining money on the shirt, then he's going to have less than two thirds remaining. So we worked out what two thirds of the remaining money was, and now we're now he's spending more, so he's going to get saving less. So our answer would be less than part A. It's that one. Question 12. Sue is working with two digit numbers. She multiplies the digits together to get an answer. For 63, she multiplies 6 by 3. So 63 gives an answer of 18. Write down a different two digit number that gives an answer of 18. Okay, well, if you think about factor pairs of 18, you've got 1 and 18, 2 and 9, 3 and 6. Is that it? I think that's it. So she's already used the three and the six pair, so we can use one of the other pairs. I'm gonna go for two and nine. So I'm gonna write down 29, because two times nine is 18. Uh, write down a two digit number that gives an answer of zero. Well, any number times by zero is zero, so as long as it ends in zero, it's gonna, it's gonna give me zero then, isn't it? So anything like 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, that is going to work. Um, there's more than one answer there, just something to zero is fine. Write down a two digit number that gives an answer greater than 70. Hmm. So a two digit number greater than 70, it's going to have to be some big numbers then, isn't it? So uh, two numbers multiplied greater than 70, so like I'm thinking eights or nines. If you think about it, eight times nine is 72, so I could have 89, couldn't I? 89 because 8 times 9 is 72. Okay, so there we go. I think I've done it. Question 13. Steve and Molly each buy 480 tea bags. Steve buys only small packs. Molly buys only large packs. In total, how much more than Molly does Steve pay? Okay, well, he's buying tea bags in uh, blocks of 80, then, isn't it? So the first thing we need to know is like how many small packs he needs to buy. So number of small packs is going to be 480 tea bags he needs to buy divided by 80. So I, this is my, I guess this is my Steve calculation. So let's just divide it out like that. So 480 divided by 80, that's just six. So he's going to have to buy six small packs of tea. So the price is going to be equal to six times one pound ninety then because that's how much a small pack costs and according to my calculator six lots of one pound ninety that comes to eleven pound forty okay so he spent eleven pound forty now let's have a quick look at uh, what molly is doing so molly so molly is going to be buying how many packs how many large packs is she going to get so same sort of idea, I'm going to take 480, which is the number of tea bags, and dividing it by uh, the number of tea, tea bags in each box. So how many times 160 fit into 480? Well, I think it goes in three times. Uh, so then we're going to be buying three lots of the large tea bags, uh, large tea packs, which is £3.25 per pack. So calculate what's three times £3.25. That comes to £9.75, which is a bargain compared to what um, Steve was paying. So how much more does he pay? How much more is going to be the amount that Steve paid minus the amount that Molly paid? So it's going to be £11.40 minus £9.75, isn't it? Okay, so it's just a matter of then typing those two numbers into your calculator and subtracting. So £11.40 minus what I had before, that comes to £1.65. So £1.65. Okay. Question 14. Match each expression on the left with the one on the right. One has been done for you. Yes, yeah, so we, we've got this one done here. So we've got an A plus a 3 and a 2. Now 3 and 2 are light terms. You can add them together and get 5. That's why it matches with A plus 5. Uh, with the next one, I've got A plus 2 three times two now three times two is six isn't it so that's going to be a plus six so it matches with that one up there a times three times two that's going to be six a isn't it it's matching with this one down here and a times three plus two 
That's going to be 3a plus 2. It's going to match with that one. Question 15. The scale drawing shows a tree and a student. The actual height of the tree is 4.2 meters. Work out the actual height of the student. Okay. So if we try and work out the ratio of the drawing scale or the drawing amount to uh, actual, what the actual lengths are, then that seven centimeters from the tree matches with 4.2 meters in reality. So that one's in centimeters and that one's in, in meters. So seven centimeters on my drawing matches with 4.2 in actual size, okay? Now we know little person uh, on, the, on the drawing is 2.5 centimeters and we wanna work out how many meters that actually is. So we're gonna use what's called the unitary method. Uh, unitary method means going via one. So if I know that seven centimeters is 4.2, if I divide it by seven, I'll get the uh, amount that one centimeter is worth. So divided by seven and then times in by 2.5 will then tell me how much 2.5 centimeters is worth, okay? So doing the other, the same thing on this side. So dividing 4.2 by seven first on my calculator. So 4.2 divided by seven, that gives me 0 0.6. So one centimeter is on the diagram is worth uh, 0 0.6 meters in reality. Uh, and then times that by 2.5, uh, that's 1.5 meters, okay? 1.5 meters. So work out the actual height of the student, 1.5 meters. Okay, now reality check. Um, this this question is um, steeped in real life, isn't it? So is 1.5 meters a reasonable height for a student? I would say yes. I think, you know, I mean, like I'm, I'm about one, 180, uh, 180 centimeters, 1 1.8 meters. Uh, 1.5 would be a bit shorter than me, but then most of my students are a bit shorter than me. So it looks it looks reasonable, uh, 150 centimetres or 1.5 metres. Uh, it looks reasonable, but, you know, just, just have a think about your answers before you move on. Are they sensible? Um, because you can catch a lot of errors that way. You know, if, you'd have, if you had, like, an answer of 300 metres, you'd be thinking, yeah, that's, that's not reasonable. I don't know any students who are 300 metres tall. Okay. Yeah, so just, just use your knowledge of the real world to catch any silly mistakes. Question 16. 60 people were asked if they would vote in an election. A quarter of the people said no. 20 people said yes. The rest said maybe. Draw and label a pie chart to show this information. Okay. So I've got 60 people uh, who voted in an election. I think what I'm going to do here is just going to do a quick table first. Because, again, you know, Plan twice, draw once is my kind of uh, philosophy on these things. So we've got uh, people here uh, and what they said. So what did they say? Voting intention. So it's either yes or it's no or it's maybe. Okay. And then I'm going to have a total at the bottom. So the number of people who in total is 60 Okay, so how many people said yes? It was a, uh, well, 20 people said yes. A quarter of the people said no. So a quarter of 60, what's that? 60 divided by four, that's 15. So 15 people said no. So the remainder said maybe. So, so far I've got 20 plus 15, that's 35. So the remainder then is gonna be 25. That adds up to 60, doesn't it? So I've got 20, 15, and 25, okay? Now I need to draw that on the pie chart, but pie charts are measured in degrees and there are 360 degrees to share out between these three options. So I need to work out next the angles, angle, okay? So there are 360 degrees in a full turn and I'm using that to represent 60 people. So if you think about it, 60 goes into 360 six times, isn't it? So if I want to con convert people into degrees, I'm gonna to have to multiply through by six because six times 60 is 360, okay? So times in 20 by six, that's gonna give me 120 degrees. Times in 15 by six, that's going to give me 90 degrees. And times in 25 by six, 
that's going to give me, what's that? That's uh, 150 then, isn't it? And they should, if you've done it correctly, add up to 360, which it does, okay? Right, next up, we need to actually draw these things in. So I think I'm gonna draw the, the easy one first. I'm gonna write, draw the right angle in. So we've already got one line drawn. So using my protractor, I'm gonna lay it out on the line and I'm going to mark 90 degrees at the edge. And then I'm gonna join up that mark that I made with my ruler. So drawing a straight line from the center up to that mark that I made, okay? So that's going to be my 90 degrees, and that means this is the no section. Now remember, it does say label your pie charts. So if you don't label it, you will lose a mark, okay? So that's the no section. Now the next section is yes, it's 120 degrees. So again, laying my protractor on one of the sides I've already drawn, and then measuring around to 120 and doing a little mark again. Uh, then I'm going to draw my, my line after that then. Okay, so there's my second section. Uh, so that's my yes section. That should be 120 degrees. Now the last section draws itself. Uh, it's always a good idea just to check it if you can uh, to make sure it is 150. So just lay my protractor on there I can see that, yep, that is 150. So that's my 150 degree angle, and that is my maybe section. Okay. Question 17a, x is at least seven. Circle the correct inequality. Well, at least seven means seven or more, doesn't it? Okay, and the inequality symbol that means seven or more is this one on the end here. X is equal to seven or it's bigger than seven. So that means it's at least seven. Part B says multiply out 5C lots of 2D plus 1. Okay, so we already had a bit of a, a question on this earlier about brackets. So remember we need to multiply out both things inside the bracket with that thing on the outside of the bracket. So what's 5C times 2D? Okay, well multiplying the number part with the number part, 5 times 2 is 10, and multiplying the letter part with the letter part, C times D, well that's just CD. So that's 10 CD, and then I've got 5C times 1. Again, times in 5 by 1, I'm just going to get 5. So that's going to be plus 5C. So 10CD plus 5C. 10CD plus 5C. And then finally, it says factorize 21X plus 28. So that's putting brackets back in again. So the thing that goes on the outside of the bracket is the common factor of those two terms. Now you can see that I've got 21 and 28 in here. So the common factor for 21 and 28 is gonna be seven, isn't it? They're both in the seven times table. So what's common goes on the outside of the bracket, and then what's not common, or uh, what you have to multiply by seven, goes on the inside of the bracket. So seven times what is 21x? That's three x. So seven times three x is 21x. And seven times what is 28? Well, seven times four is 28. So it's gonna be seven lots of three X plus four. Seven lots of three X plus four. Question 18a. The people at a party are either adults or children. And the ratio of adults to children is nine to 11. So there's slightly more children than adults. What percentage are adults? Okay. Now with ratio, you're comparing what you've got with what you don't have. So if you're looking at adults, there are nine adults for every 11 not adults, okay? So in total, there is gonna be nine adults out of nine plus 11. It's gonna be nine out of 20. As a fraction, nine twentieths of this um, group are gonna be adults, okay? Because nine plus 11 is, is 20. So what is that as a percentage? Uh, well, I'll just do it on the calculator. 9 divided by 20 times 100, that comes out to be 45%. 45%. Okay. Part B says the people at a different party are from Spain, France, or Germany. 68% are from Spain, and the number of people from France is equal to the number of people from Germany. Work out the ratio of the number of people from Spain to the number of people from France. 
Give your answer in the form n to 1. Okay. So I'm going to just do this as a percentage. So 68% of the people are from Spain. So what's left then? So if 68% are from Spain, then 100 minus 68, that's, that's 32, isn't it? So 32% is not from Spain. So that means the number of people from France and from Germany must total 32% between them. Uh, and because they're equal, if I divide 32 by 2, if I halve it, I get 16. So that means that 16% of my people must be from France and the other 16% are from Germany. So if I want to work out the ratio of people from Spain to the people from Germany, so if I've got 68% from Spain and 16% from Germany, then they are in a ratio of 68 to 16. Okay. Now it says here, that's already in a ratio, but it says here I need to have it in the form n to 1. So I need to kind of force this number to be 1, even if it breaks the number on the left. So how am I going to turn 16 into 1? I'm going to, well, I'm just going to divide by 16, aren't I? I'm going to divide this side by 16. And if I divide that side by 16, I'm going to have to do the same on this side. 68 divided by 16, what's that? 68 divided by 16, um, 4.25. So normally, when you write ratios, you're meant to keep like the, the numbers whole, aren't you? Whole numbers uh, when you write a ratio. But if it says you need to put it in the form n to 1 or 1 to n, that often breaks the other number uh, into a decimal. That's fine. Just need to go with it. That's what they want. That's what they're going to get. So the ratio in the form of n to 1 is going to be 4.25 to 1. Question 19a, circle the point that is on the line 4x plus y equals 7. Okay. Now, the way you can test if a point is on a line or not is you can just substitute the two coordinates into the equation and see if the equation holds. So, is 4x plus y equal to 7 when x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 1? Okay. In other words, is 4 lots of 2 plus 1 is that equal to 7, yay or nay? No, it's not, is it? Because 4 plus uh, four lots of 2 is 8 plus 1 is 9. 9 is not equal to 7, okay? So this one is a no-no. Okay, so let's work out the next one. Is 4x plus y equal to 7 when x is 2 and y is minus 3? Well, let's find out. So for this one, 4 lots of 2 plus negative 1, is that equal to 7? Well, 4 lots of 2 is 8, take away 1, well, that is 7, isn't it? So that's 7 equal to 7. So that one is correct. So I think it's that one. I'm just going to just double check the other ones while I'm at it. So again, if x is 1 and y is 2, does that mean that 4 lots of 1 plus 2, is that equal to 7? Well, no, because 4 ones is 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 is not equal to 7. So that one is not true. And then finally... Uh, if x is minus 1 and y is 2, I'm pretty sure it doesn't hold then. So 4 lots of minus 1 plus 2, is that equal to 7? Well, 4 lots of minus 1 is minus 4 plus 2 is minus 2. Minus 2 is not equal to 7. Not true. So it's just that one, 2 minus 1 that works. Part B says write down the coordinates of the y-intercept of the line y equals 3x plus 8. Right, now equations of straight lines can be written in the form y equals mx plus c, where m is the gradient and c is the y-intercept, which is what we're looking for here. Now, if I compare that with what I've got up here, so m is the coefficient of x, that's that 3 there, and, y, uh, and the y-intercept is the constant on the end, which is 8. Okay, so the y-intercept of this line is 8. So if I was to draw like a sketch of the axes, there's the y-axis, here's the x-axis, then I know my straight line is kind of passing through the y-axis there at 8. So what is the coordinate of that point? Well, the y-coordinate is 8. What's the x-coordinate? Well, it lies on x is equal to 0 down here, doesn't it? So this is actually the coordinate 0, 8. So it's 0, 8 is the one that I'm after. Uh, work out the gradient of the line 2y equals 10x. Now I said equations of the form y equals mx plus c, then m is the gradient, uh, which is the number in front of x. But I don't have y equals mx plus c here. I've got 2y equals mx plus nothing. 
So to make it look more like what I've got up, uh, more like y equals mx plus c, if I divide both sides by 2, I'm going to get y is equal to 5x. Okay. Now if I compare that with y equals mx plus c, now again, I don't really have a c here, but that just means it's going to pass through the origin as c is equal to 0. And m, the gradient, is still that coefficient of x there. m is equal to 5 m is equal to 5. Question 20. Jose and Maria each take a test. The probability that Jose passes is 0 0.8. The probability that Maria passes is 0 0.4. Complete the tree diagram. Okay. So if the probability that Jose passes is 0 0.8, then the probability it doesn't pass is going to be 1 minus 0 0.8. It's going to be 0 0.2 because the two probabilities need to add up to 1. So that's going to be 0 0.8 and 2. Similarly, the probability that Maria passes is 0.4, so the probability that she doesn't pass is going to be 1 minus 0.4, which is 0.6. So I'm going to have a 0.6 here, and it's going to be repeated here, 0.4 and 0.6. So work out the probability that they both pass. Both pass is that Jose passes, and then Maria passes. So the probability of pass pass and we're just going to multiply those numbers along the route. So I'm going to go through 0.8 first, and then I'm going to go through 0.4. Uh, so the probability of pass and pass, and, and in probability means multiply, I'm going to multiply those two numbers together. 0.8 times 0.4, that comes to 0.32. So the probability of pass pass equals 0.32. Question 6. Show that 2,125 can be written as a cube number multiplied by a prime number between 10 and 20. So I know the prime number needs to be between 10 and 20. Now if I divided 2,125 by a number between 10 and 20, divided by 10 is going to give me about 200. And if I divide it by 20, it's going to give me about 100. So I'm looking for a cube number that lies between about a hundred and a two hundred aren't there and that, actually there's not that many okay uh, if you think about five cubed five cubed is 125 uh, and then six cubed is already above isn't it isn't it 216 so it's going to be i think it's going to have to be one of those two then isn't it now so next let's consider what primes you actually have between 10 and 20 what are our choices so we've got 11 haven't we 11 is prime uh, 13's prime, not 15, 17's prime, 19's prime, okay? So it's going to be one of those, isn't it? So I'm going to just try some stuff out now, see if I can hit the number. Okay, so maybe 125 times the biggest one, 19, what's that? 1, 2, 5 times 19, uh, that's 2, 3, 7, 5, so that's not right. Okay, um, what else could we try? Well, it's slightly too big. Let's try the slightly smaller one. 125 times 17. So 125 times 17. Ah, oh, that one works. Uh, so I'd have just kept on trying different combinations of um, 5 cube and 6 cube with that list of primes until I found the right one. But it didn't take me too long to hit that one. So it's that one there, isn't it? Uh, 125 times 17. Show that a cube number multiplied by a prime number between... What, uh, 10 and 20, so I have then, so it's, therefore it's 5 cubed times 17, that's what we're looking for. Now I'm looking at the answer, I realise it's a product of prime factors, isn't it? So I could have probably just shortcutted all of this guesswork by just simply typing in 2125 into the calculator and hitting the fat key, uh, and that would have come up with the answer straight away. Dope, okay, oh well, good job Mr Tompkins, let's move on. Question eight, a school play takes place each day from Monday to Friday. Here are the attendances on four of the days. This is in the nice little table here. And we're told for all five days, the mean of the mean attendance is 90. Work out the attendance on Friday. Okay. Well, if the mean for the five days was 90, then we can get the total number of uh, attendance quite easily by multiplying them together, can't we? Because... Um, Normally, we do mean is equal to your total divided by your number of things, isn't it? So uh, if I know that 5 is the number of things, 
And if I do uh, my number of things times the mean, it's going to give me my total back, isn't it? Okay, so 5 times 90, so the total then is equal to 5 times 90. Uh, and 5 90s is 450. So I know that there are going to be 450 people coming over the five days. Okay, so then all I need to do then is add up the others and take it away from um, 450 to get Friday's attendance. So Friday's attendance is going to be the total over the five days minus the other four added together, isn't it? Okay, so if you're going to type it into the calculator, write it down first on the paper. Um, in case you make a mistake, then at least you get credit for having the idea to add them together. Okay, so I'm going to do that. That comes out to be 110. So a big night Friday, 110. Question seven, Sam types a constant number of words per minute. He takes eight minutes to type a report of 416 words. How long does it take him to type an essay of 1,534 words? Give your answer in minutes and seconds. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do is just going to convert minutes into seconds to start with, because otherwise it's going to be difficult to uh, calculate with. So eight minutes, uh, I can just type that into my calculator actually. So eight times 60, that's uh, 480 seconds, isn't it? So I can write that as a ratio, can't I? So if I do uh, time to words as a ratio, so I, I know then it took him 480 seconds uh, to produce... 416 words okay now I want to know how long it's going to take him to produce 1534 words so I can use something called the unitary method and go via one okay uh, by dividing by 416 and then multiplying by 1534 if I do the same thing this side so 480 divide by 416 Okay, that comes out to be, well, 15 over 13. I might just write down as 15 over 13 because it would be quicker. So 15 over 13. And then multiply that by 1534. I get 1770. Okay, so that means it takes 1770 seconds in order to type that amount of words. Now, what's that in minutes and seconds? So to convert that into minutes and seconds, I'm going to divide it by 60. Okay, now that's going to probably going to give me a horrible answer. Oh, no, not that horrible. But then if I then press the hours, minutes and seconds button over here, you can see it's going to convert it into um, 2930, which is 29. So that's going to give me 29 minutes and 30 seconds then is my answer. Question 12, we're told that 4y equals 5x and we're asked which statement is correct. Y is 80% of x, y is 125% of x, x is 20% of y, x is 400% of y. Okay, now I can write this statement in two different ways. I can write it as, an, uh, as a formula for y. So dividing both sides by 4, I'm going to get y is 5 over 4x, which as a decimal would be y is equal to... Um, five quarters, that'd be 1.25x, isn't it? Okay, uh, 1.25 as a multiplier is what you would apply if it was 125%. So what we're saying here is y is 125% of x. That's what that reads, okay? So it is going to be this one. Now, if I did it the other way around so that I had x in terms of y, I would get x equals, dividing both sides by 5 to start with, I'd have x is 4 fifths of y, okay, uh, which as a, a decimal would be x is um, 0 0.8 lots of y, and that would read that x is 80% of y then, which isn't one of my options down there, okay? So it's definitely that one there, y is 125% of x, and none of the others. Question nine, Rosie makes phone calls to try and sell broadband. Today she made 120 calls. The table shows the results. So on 33 of the occasions that she rang, no one answered. On 
81 occasions she got through but she didn't make a sale and then on six occasions uh, the phone was answered and she did make a sale so write down the relative frequency that a, a call was not answered so relative frequency is given as successful outcomes over total outcomes isn't it so relative frequency is successful outcomes over make my pen a little bit less chunky over total outcomes okay so the successful outcomes here is that you know it says successful but it says the call was not answered that's the one we're looking for so success is what we're at, what we're looking for so that's 33 okay and then the total outcomes then is going to be uh, all those values added together then so 3 1 and 6 make 10 so 3 plus 1 4 plus 8 is 12 so that's 120 calls yeah oh we had that in the in the question anyway didn't we okay so 120 then is the total outcomes so what we're doing then is we're going to be dividing 33 by 120 uh, just tap that into the calculator so you just check if it doesn't cancel down okay so it's 11 over 40 in its lowest terms part b says during the rest of the week rosie will make 500 calls using the results in the table how many sales does she expect to make during the rest of the week Well, if you remember from the table, she made six successful calls in 120 calls. So her probability of making a sale is six out of 120. So our expected number of successes then, expected uh, successes, is going to be the probability of success or the relative frequency of success, which is six out of 120 times the number of trials then or the number of times that we did the thing which is 500 okay so it's 6 120th of 500 so 6 over 120 times 500 that comes out to be 25 so you, she should expect to make 25 sales in in the week question 10 harry and ellie each bought a printer and a hard drive here is some information about how much they paid okay so Harry paid £80 for the printer and £25 for the hard drive. Ellie paid 10% less than Harry for the printer, but 20% 20 more than Harry for the hard drive. Ellie says, in total, I have paid more than Harry because 20% is greater than 10%. Is she correct? Uh, tick a box. Well, she's paying 20% more on a thing that costs a lot less. So it's not necessarily going to be the case. Uh, what is... 10% of 80. Let's start off how much less she paid for the for the printer. So 10% of 80. That's going to be 0 0.1 times 80, isn't it? Which is 8. So she paid £8 less for the printer. So she, that was a saving, wasn't it? And 20% of £25. That's going to be 0 0.2 times 25. What's that then? Is that not? Is that five? So that's five pounds, isn't it? So she paid five pound less for the for the printer, but five pound more for the high hard drive. So I think she actually saved three pounds. Um, so then the difference. is going to be minus eight plus five, which is minus three. Uh, so no is the answer uh, and why because she paid three pounds less overall question 11 a shape is made by joining a right angle triangle to a rectangle okay uh, and then we need to work out the area of the shape okay so we've got two different shapes we've got um, area one which is a triangle and we've got area two, which is a rectangle. Okay, so let's let's work out area one first. Area one is a triangle, so triangles normally have an area of half base times height. Now, base doesn't have to be the one on the bottom. Uh, just your base and height need to be at right angles to each other. So I can use 
this side here as the base and I can use this side here as the height because they are at right angles to each other uh, and so that that would be perfectly acceptable for finding the area. So then that is going to be a half times 30 times 16, just subbing those values in, uh, in into my equation. And then um, half of 16 is, is 8, and 8 times 30, 3 8 at 24, and a 0, and that's 240, isn't it? So that's going to have an area of 240 uh, cube, uh, centimeters squared. What about A2? Now, A2 is slightly more problematic because, well, it's a rectangle. It's got an easy, easy formula for finding it, but we only know one of them so far, don't we? We know this length here is 52. Okay, so one of them is going to be 52. But what is the other one? Hmm? We don't actually currently know this one, do we? Okay, I haven't got that one. But you can see that that side there, uh, which is going to be the width of this um, rectangle, is the hypotenuse of that right angle triangle, isn't it? So I can just use Pythagoras theorem to find this one. Okay, so here I can use c squared equals a squared plus b squared, where a is 30 and b is 16. Okay, so what's that then? 30 squared plus 16 squared comes out to be 1156. Okay, so then C is going to be the root of that then, isn't it? Root answer, that's 34. Okay, so that means my hypotenuse is 34. So that's 34, so that's 34. Okay, so subbing that into my calculation here. 52 times 34 times that by 30, 52. I'm going to get 1768. And so then the area is going to be those two things added together then, isn't it? So it's going to be 240 plus 1768. And that comes out to be 2008 units centimeters squared. Question five, solve five lots of two X minus one is equal to six X plus nine. Okay. Now, um, you've actually got two choices often when you've got a number outside a bracket like this. Uh, don't immediately multiply out the brackets. Just double check first if that 5 doesn't divide into the other side. Now it doesn't here, but often it's quicker to if, if the other side is divisible by 5 to do that rather than multiplying out the brackets. Uh, I can't do it here though, so I am going to have to go ahead and multiply out. Uh, so 5 lots of 2x, that is 10x. And 5 lots of minus 1, that's minus 5. So I get 10 minus, a 10x minus 5 is equal to 6x plus 9, okay? Uh, now, notice that we've got x's on both sides, okay? So I'm going to take the smaller one away from both sides. So take away 6x from both sides. That will kind of remove them from that side and just leave me with x's on one side. So I'm going to get 4x minus 5 is equal to 9, okay? Last step is to deal with this minus 5 here. Adding on 5 to both sides, okay, they'll cancel. Uh, and then I've got 4x is equal to 14. Okay, and then finally, dividing both sides by 4. That's cancelling with that. And I'm going to be left with x is equal to, uh, well, 14 over 4. What's that? 7 over 2. I'm just going to leave it as a top-heavy fraction, okay? Uh, perfectly acceptable. 7 over 2. You can find more exam question compilations over here. For more past paper walkthroughs, click down here. If you want to visit my Amazon shop with my recommendations for calculators, revision guides and other maths related stuff, click down here. Good luck in your revision and in your exams and see you again next time.